Thanks, Annabelle, and uh, good evening again. It's great to be here this evening, kicking off a new sermon series. As I said earlier, I'm Vicky, uh, and this evening we are starting to explore the book of Ruth. Ruth is a stunning little book. It's tucked into the middle of Israel's dramatic Old Testament history. It's just four chapters long, but there is loads packed into it. And we're going to be digging into one chapter each week for the next four weeks, beginning tonight, surprisingly enough, with chapter one, uh, as we look at grief and repentance. And then next week, we're looking at the favor of God, and the following two weeks, we've got the shadow of God's wings and then willing redeemer. In the first chapter of Ruth, there are two main characters, a mother-in-law called Naomi and her daughter-in-law, Ruth. And to put it plainly, the two of them are having a truly dreadful time of it. Just to help us grasp a little of what life was like for Naomi and Ruth, I'd like us to imagine that I am Naomi. No mother-in-law jokes, please. Um, I have a wonderful husband. We have two handsome grown-up sons. Easy to imagine so far. Those who don't know me, I do have two grown-up sons. Uh, young, handsome grown-up sons. Sorry, should have said that. Then there is a serious economic crisis here in the UK, and we lose our jobs. Our home is repossessed. We literally can't afford to eat. Our only choice is to travel to another country where there's chance of finding work and a slim chance of surviving. So my husband and I and my two boys, we pack up everything that we can carry. We scrape together every last penny that we own and we travel abroad. We end up in a country that's very different from our own. The people look different from us. The language is strange to us. The food, the traditions, the whole culture feels very, very foreign. But we find a way to make it work. We manage to generate a modest income. And before long, both our boys have met and married local women from this foreign country. The trouble is, my husband then dies, leaving me, Naomi, as a grief-stricken widow. And it gets worse. Both our boys die as well leaving me alone with my two foreign daughters-in-law, who are now also both widows. It's not a great situation, is it? Now, obviously, this didn't happen in Bristol in 2023. It happened in the Middle East several hundred years before Jesus. Let's take a look at a map. Naomi was from the people of Israel, so she and her family lived in Bethlehem, which is here. Uh, and when the famine hit Bethlehem, Naomi's family was forced to find work over the border in Moab, which is there. Thank you, tech team. <laughs> this is the land of Israel's enemies. And Naomi is stranded in this foreign country. Her husband has died. Her two boys have died. She's got no income. Her only relatives are two foreign widowed daughters-in-law. And then news reaches her that economically, things are picking up again back in Bethlehem. So she decides to make the long journey back to where she started. She has no close relatives anymore, but she's holding on to a faint hope that someone might be kind enough to take care of a penniless widow. So she tells her daughters-in-law to return to their families in Moab, and she sets off for home. But the daughters-in-law say, no, we must come with you. But Naomi insists, she cries, she tells them plainly to stay in their own country, to find new husbands and to start afresh. One daughter-in-law agrees with the plan and stays in Moab. But the other daughter-in-law, Ruth, promises that she will never stop being part of Naomi's family. Even though they are culturally, politically, religiously and ethnically completely different, Ruth embraces her mother-in-law and says... Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. What a legend. These two, very different, very vulnerable, desperately poor, bereaved women, begin the long journey together, daring to hope that Bethlehem might somehow be the birthplace of hope and mercy and salvation. 
Let's hear the original version of the story, which uh, Annabelle is going to read from us. And that's from Ruth, chapter one. Uh, if you want to have that open on your phones in front of you, then please do. And Annabelle is going to read that for us. Ruth, chapter one. <clears throat> in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah went together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was a, a mi- Elimelech. Elimelech. Thank you. I, I even Run at it. That. Run I, at I, it. I always practice <laughs> it, honestly. I'll say it wrong next time as well. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife, thank you. His <laughs> wife's name was Naomi. Oh, it's got more. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They married Moabite women, one named Orpha and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness, as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept out loud, and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought that there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept aloud again. Then Orpha kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realised that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Thank you, Annabelle. Bit of a monster reading there, names and length. But what an opening to Ruth. Tragedy, jeopardy, loyalty, and a cliffhanger ending. Two widows from enemy states, both taking a turn at being refugees. We're going to explore the implications of their grief and their desperate search for mercy this evening. But first, there's just four things I want us to bear in mind as we dive into the story this evening and as we look at the whole of the book of Ruth. First of all, these are women. Now, that might sound obvious, but it's hard to overstate the significance that the fact that this is a story about women. This is part of the historic literature of the ancient Near East, and the historic literature of the ancient Near East includes virtually no stories with women as the main characters. The Old Testament contains a few stories of women. Many of them remain unnamed. So when the women are named and when they are central to the narrative, this is a big deal. If these ancient cultures, which were totally patriarchal, completely male-dominated, if they choose to highlight the story of two women, we need to sit up and take notice. Ruth is not only a woman, she's foreign, she's widowed, she's childless, she's from an enemy nation. 
If her story is worthy of its own book, alongside all the big guns of the law and the prophets, then within these four chapters, there is something vital going on. Secondly, in the Old Testament, the book of Ruth sits right alongside the book of Judges. And that is no coincidence. What happens in Ruth happens at the same time as the dramatic events in Judges, a time of famine and hardship. Judges describes moral and spiritual decline, selfishness, personal ambition, military destruction. It was a rough and violent time. The original readers would, of Ruth would have known that, and they would have recognized the stark contrast of Ruth's story of loyalty and faithfulness, kindness and generosity. It is so different from the power struggles and the mess of the book of Judges. Ruth presents us with a beautiful, understated, seismic culture shock. It's the story of God's faithfulness to, to his people through one tiny case study as one seemingly insignificant Moabite woman, a foreigner and a refugee, steps into a vital role in God's story of redemption. Thirdly, we need to take note of the importance of God's covenant with his people, which is central to the significance of Ruth's story. Covenant is, put very simply, the relationship between God and his people. And within this covenant relationship is a responsibility, an unspoken law, if you like, to show loving faithfulness, kindness, goodness, mercy, and compassion. But it's more than just a nice thought or attitude. It's an action. It's something done for someone in real and desperate need, and it comes out of relationship. The way God treats us with compassion and kindness and faithfulness is the way he expects us to treat each other. And this relationship, this covenant relationship, was an essential part of the structures of Israelite society. It's how God describes, maybe how he even defines his relationship with his chosen people, his children. He wants to show people what a relationship with him could look like. And this idea of covenant was completely ingrained within Israel's culture. It's less obvious to us hundreds of years later, so we do have to pay attention but let's look out for the significance of these attitudes and expectations which are woven right through the story of Ruth. And fourthly, as we start to unpack this stunning little story, let's just keep an eye on Easter. Now, it might feel a bit of a handbrake turn to be looking back centuries into Israel's history just one week after Easter. But if we keep our eyes peeled, there are some extraordinary parallels with the story of Jesus here. Grief-stricken women returning to the places where God's promises were made, crying out in their sorrow at the pain and separation and bitterness of death, faithfully seeking God's mercy, unaware that they're actually playing a central role in the unfolding of God's plans, his grace, and ultimately his kingdom. So that's my four things to look out for as we go along. The significance of women in God's story, the stark contrast with the book of Judges, the importance of covenant relationships, putting God's faithfulness and mercy at the center of everything, and the beautiful ways in which Ruth's story connects us to Jesus' story. So tonight's theme at last, <laughs> grief and repentance. Naomi has nothing. Her husbands and sons have died. She feels totally alone. She feels as though God is against her, as though she's being punished for decisions she didn't even make about living in foreign territory among the enemies of Israel. She is empty, she is grieving, she has nothing going for her. All the things that would normally be options for a widow are not options for her. She can't return to her parents, they're no longer alive. She can't remarry, she's past childbearing age. And like most women at the time, she has no skill or craft she can use to make her own way. Nor does she have children, the worst fate for an Israelite woman. The only thing left for her is to return to her wider family as she has heard that God had provided for them. Perhaps they might share some of it with her if they remembered her at all. It was her only hope, but a very small one. There's a whole load of grief going on for Naomi here. Grief for those Naomi loved who had died, her husband and her grown-up children. Grief for being abandoned and alone. Grief for being abandoned and alone in a foreign country. 
grief for the standing she would have had in the community, but no longer has. Grief for what she left behind all those years ago. And this grief is painful. It's understandably making her self-absorbed and bitter. She even changes her name to Mara, which literally means bitter. She has been dealt a rough hand. What does God do with this grief? Chapter 1 doesn't tell us. How annoying is that? I want to stand here and say how God works when life is hard, how we can see him working. And we can, we know that's true, and we'll see it later on in Ruth. But not yet. Not in this bit of the story. This bit of the story is hard, and no one knows how it's going to end. And actually, that's a far more realistic picture of what Naomi was facing. No immediate answers. No, I know God is with me. In fact, Naomi thought the exact opposite. She thought she was being punished. Verse 21 says, the Lord has afflicted me. No hindsight to help her. Equally, no trite comments that deny the pain of what she's going through. No well-meaning friends who try to comfort her. Now, obviously, having friends to support and comfort when things are hard are, is really important. But sometimes people who don't know us so well say things that actually don't help. All Naomi has is the raw pain of her grief, <clears throat> her emptiness, and despair. And as she holds this grief, we see her determination to get back to Bethlehem from Moab. Do you remember this map? It's at least a 60-mile journey. And there's a whopping great dead sea in the way. And at a time when women traveling alone, traveling alone was not a good idea, we can see how determined Naomi had to be. This journey, at the end of which there was not even any guarantee of anything, was not going to be easy, nor was it necessarily going to be safe. And I don't think that there's many of us that can imagine that situation. There is a glimmer of hope. We see it in the last verse of this chapter. Maybe all isn't lost. People do remember her. Isn't that Naomi? We hear people asking. And the timing is, shall we say, providential, as the barley harvest is just beginning. But Naomi doesn't see any of this. And this wasn't a simple choice for Naomi. It wasn't a let's pack our wheelie suitcase and leap on a train and go and stay with some family sort of event. It was a hard choice, forced by circumstance, leaving what she knew for something that she didn't, and all the while holding this terrible grief. She was a refugee with no expectation of a welcome when she arrived in Bethlehem. She wasn't doing this because she knew it was going to be all right. She was doing this because it was the only option available to her. And in the same way that there's a tiny glimmer of hope in this story this chapter one of this story, there is kindness here too. This kindness is more obvious, and we see that in Ruth. Ruth shows the kindness that is a responsibility in this covenant relationship that we were talking about earlier on. Now, Ruth has no covenant history. She is not an Israelite. She is a foreigner and a refugee. But she shows kindness in abundance. It's a stark contrast to the chaos of what's going on in Judges, which is full of Israelites who do have a covenant history and who should know better. Instead, it's Ruth, the non-Israelite, the mistrusted foreigner who shows kindness throughout the book, especially here in chapter 1. And that's encapsulated in that moment that Ruth makes the choice to stay with Naomi. That's in verses 16 and 17 and perhaps the most well-known bit of the book of Ruth, and we've touched on it a bit already, but let's have a look at that in a bit more detail. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. And this is where repentance comes in. Repentance as in turning back or heading home, which is slightly ironic as that Ruth isn't actually doing the returning. She's Moabite and Bethlehem is a new place for her. But Naomi is the one doing the returning. 
But what Ruth is doing is turning towards God. And that is definitely part of repentance. She's not turning towards Israel's God and their faith. She's turning towards Naomi's God and Naomi's people, which means it's a relational choice, a choice to embrace the God who had apparently rejected Naomi. I wonder why she did that, having seen what looks like rejection on Yahweh's part. Maybe Ruth didn't want to add to Naomi's woes by rejecting her as well. Or maybe she saw something in Naomi, despite everything, that was of God and his love. I don't think we'll ever really know her motivation. But what we do know is that Ruth chooses Naomi's God and Naomi's people, despite Naomi's best attempts to stop her. And that word for repentance and return appears 12 times in this chapter. It's important. And that repetition, that use of it 12 times implies that it's not just a single act. It's a process. It's a journey towards God with many acts of returning along the way and with many ups and downs. It's not a job done, tick box exercise, but it takes time. And turning to God is a choice again and again. Let's look at the verses just before the verses we've just read, just to get a slightly fuller picture. So these are verses 11 to 13. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait till they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. You can't argue with some of Naomi's logic here. It does seem reasonable. It makes total sense for Orpah and Ruth to say, stay with their Moabite family and have the opportunity to remarry. If we were following logic, we would all have gone with Orpah. Orpah didn't do anything wrong in choosing to stay. Her choice made sense. The narrator of Ruth doesn't criticize her at all. But what it does do, though, is highlight Ruth's loyalty and kindness. Her choices go beyond the logical. And it's easy to underestimate how unlikely Ruth's response was in this ancient context where women's only fulfillment was marriage and childbirth. But here was Ruth not choosing that route, but instead choosing to align herself with a foreigner and a refugee and a woman with no guarantee of safety or security if they even made it to Bethlehem, which was hardly likely. Ruth's faith, Ruth's choice to turn to Naomi's God defies human logic and wisdom. And God does provide for her, and God does use her, and God does bless her. But that's not this week's story. It's just a delicious foretaste of what is to come. So what does that all mean? What does this story of a woman from so many years ago in such a different time and place, what can that possibly mean for us in 21st century Britain? There's something here about not counting yourself out. No one is beyond being used or blessed by God. It's never too late to turn to God, whether or not you understand what's going on. Naomi didn't have a clue. She had her grief and acted in the only way she could think of. Ruth didn't have a clue. She was just as kind as she could possibly be. God can use anyone a foreigner, a refugee, a widow, even a woman. But let, So let's not let our attitudes, our prejudices, get in the way of God working or in the way of being used by or blessed by God. I'm not good enough. I'm not in the right family. I don't have anything to offer. I'm in a difficult place right now. We may think some of these things. We may feel them, and some of them may even be true. But nothing stops God. Nothing. God is beyond logic and reason, and his kindness and generosity don't make any sense. So don't assume and don't reason yourself or anyone else out of being used by or blessed by God. Ruth was a foreigner. Naomi was a childless widow. And at the end of this book of Ruth, we see that King David is born into this family which means this is the family into which eventually Jesus is born. 
God says, this is my family. These are loyal, faithful people who know how to love and treat each other, who act with kindness and compassion. My family is made up of foreigners, immigrants, refugees, people who don't fit of any of society's expectations and who can't even support themselves. This is where I make my earthly home. This is where I belong. So let's not count anyone out, including ourselves. And there's something in here as well about our grief. It can feel as though grief might overwhelm us. But this is where I see echoes of Easter. Life is painful. We don't always know the end. No one understood the cross on Good Friday. But Easter Sunday was on its way. Emptiness to fullness and celebration. Grief to joy. Death to life. When life is hard and grief feels overwhelming, when you have to carry on after the death of your children, what must that have been like for Naomi? I can't begin to imagine. I know grief, but not that sort of grief. But I do know that Jesus said this from the first few verses of Isaiah 61. He said this about himself. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has appointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a garment of despair. This is what happens in this beautiful, ordinarily extraordinary story of Ruth. God used Ruth and Naomi and Boaz, as we'll see later, to care for each other, to bring comfort and freedom. So let's hold on to these promises for us, and let's make these promises real for other people. Let's be as kind as Ruth and as generous as we will discover Boaz to be. As foreigners and refugees find their way to us, as people who are no use come and ask for help, as those with so much pain come, as the ones whom everyone else has written off come, which actually, for some of us, may be the wealthy or those who wield power. Maybe those are the ones who we think are beyond God's reach. Let us welcome all of them into our family. Let's let them, like Jesus, find a home with us. 